Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Ian. Um, I'm going to be delivering my uh, first sermon to you. So, here we go. Um, so, a couple weeks ago, um, I was talking with some friends um, about just like the sports that we used to play in high school, things like that. A couple friends that played basketball, a couple friends that played soccer, which I played both of those too. But, but one that I just really, really enjoyed um, was baseball. And you know, on uh, on a baseball diamond, there's uh, I think there's nine different positions. You have the outfield and you have the infield. Um, you know, the outfield's job is to like to catch the fly balls whenever they go far out there, and to like throw it back into the infield. Um, and so the great thing about being in the outfield is that you have time to catch the the ball. However, when you're on the infield, you're a lot closer to the impact of the ball. So whether it gets hit and it's a ground ball and it hits off the ground and it comes right to you, it comes like very quick. So you have to have a quick reaction time. Like one thing that's important in baseball is to have quick reflexes. Um, it's the same thing with batting. You know, you have to be able to see and know how you're going to turn your body and the way in which you're going to swing your bat when you're waiting at home plate, when a pitcher is throwing you a fastball. It all comes down to reflexes and like split second decisions. Um, and when I was thinking about that, I was like, man, how interesting is it of like what our instinct decisions are here, like in our lives? Like what are the what are our reflexes as we go throughout this life when going through hard things and going through good things and making decisions, big impactful decisions that don't only affect us now, but affect us like way later down the road as well. And so the main point of my sermon is going to be about a spiritual reflex. Um, and recently I've been reading in Acts and man, I've just been so impacted of how the Holy Spirit just made its presence known and has impacted people um, throughout Jerusalem and throughout um, the the places that Paul and Silas are journeying and, and, and ministering to. And um, one of the most impactful stories is that I have come across in my reading is, uh, is Acts 16. And um, you know, before this is that Paul and Silas, they're out on their missionary journey, they're preaching the gospel, uh, but at the same time, like they're being persecuted from the, the Jews and um, the Pharisees, the people that persecuted Jesus as well, and got him crucified. And um, in Acts 16, um, they had been being followed by a girl who was possessed um, by a demon, and, and after a while, he finally casts her out, and people see see that happen and what they do is that they actually they drug him um, they drag him to the authorities um, and Paul and Silas they're they're beaten and they're whipped um, and thrown into jail so if we looked at Acts 16 and it's going to be verse 22 through 30 so if you have your Bibles pull them out you can read along with me um, so verse 22 it says a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods they were severely beaten and they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and other prisoners were listening. And I remember when I when I read this, I just was so unbelievably impacted of like, how can someone go from doing what that is that they're called to do like they're living in the purpose in which like god has like that god has given them and because of that they're being persecuted and it literally says that they are whipped with wooden rods and i mean you can probably imagine like how severe it was right like there's like open wounds on their back from where they were struck there's probably like blisters around of like where they're probably being cuffed both on their hands and their feet and one big thing that I noticed here is that the first thing that they do is that they sing praises to God. And it's like, how often do we in this world have a reflex of looking directly to God and singing praises towards Him? And actually, if you were to look at the word... Um, like it says like hymns in the Greek translation of hymns is it's hymnos, but it means a song in honor of God or to celebrate God in song. 
And it's so interesting to me how it's like they just come off of probably like one of the worst beatings that they've experienced, and yet they're immediately praising God and they're celebrating him and who he is. Like, how does that happen? That just doesn't make any sense. You know, I think of times of like where I've been through and I and it's immediate my immediate response is the opposite of that. And it's actually to blame God um, of my circumstance and my situation of whatever it is that I'm going through. You know, I remember back when I was young, my mom had cancer and I didn't understand what was happening. I was overwhelmed with emotion and right away, I just remember thinking like, God, like, why would you do this to me? Like, why would you let this happen? Like, this is someone I love. This is someone who, who loves you. And like, yet you're letting them become like sick and like bedridden and having to go through chemo and, and all the extra things with that. And then, you know, a year after that, my, my dad was unfortunately sentenced to jail and had to be in jail for three to four years. And again, of just going through all of that trauma and thinking of like, why God, why did you do this? Like, what was the point? Like, and just basically blaming him for every bad thing that happened in between that time. And I think us in the world, that's what we do is that when th bad things happen, that we immediately go and blame God and, and put everything on him and the w why this and why that. And it becomes more about what you don't have instead of what God has actually given you, of who he actually is. How often do we look at a bad situation or circumstance and immediately praise him? Like, how do we do that? It's hard. It's really hard. What's your reflex? You know, like, what do you do when you can't pay your rent? Do you do you grumble and moan and just sit there and complain and and blame God that like you haven't gotten enough finances to be able to pay your rent or to buy your groceries? Or have you put your faith in something that isn't eternal and thinking that you are the one who is actually in control and who can actually do the work in order to get these things. It's like, yes, like we have, like we are able to go out and we are able to accomplish certain things on our own strength. But when you're put in certain situations, when you've only leaned on your own strength, then when everything hits the fan, you have nowhere, you don't know what to do. There's nowhere for you to go or nowhere for you to run. So automatically you blame God. Because it's like, why would you do this to me? I'm out here. I'm being disciplined. I'm, I'm grinding. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working towards the goal. I'm accomplishing goals. Like, why are you doing this to me? And it's like, well, again, going back to like, have you put your faith in something that is carnal and that is fleeting? And have you forgotten that God is the provider of all things? Have you forgotten that God is a healer if your family is sick? Have you forgotten that God is um, a savior if you have someone who is he's drifted away from the faith or doesn't know who he is? It's a really hard place to be, to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and know that you don't have control over what's actually happening. And I think what a result of what that is, is actually it's a lack of trust because we have to acknowledge that he's in the he is the one that is in control of everything that happens on earth even satan had to go to him to ask god if it was okay for him to go and torment job there's all these things that continue to happen and it's always us looking back on like how can we take this on on our own strength and try and figure it out on our own but the simple answer and the hard reality is that we can't and one thing that I think is just unbelievably reassuring is being able to look back and remember of what God has already done up until this point. God has already been there and has gotten you through certain things all, like already. But yet when bad things happen, we just forget. We forget about all of them. You know, part of my personal testimony is, I, you know, I went through a really bad, um, you know, Men mental illness honestly like I went crazy I was I was hooked on drugs I was doing all these crazy things I was out partying I was being promiscuous like all this kind of stuff and I remember one day I just broke down on my knees and God literally in a day in a night lifted that off of me I was having suicidal thoughts I was anxious I was depressed I didn't have any um, vision um, for what my life was going to look like I was just stuck in this pit and I just didn't know a way out but God like brought me out of that 
And I remember I got out of that and I was so pumped and I remember I was like on fire for God and I knew he was real and he was my savior and I could pray to him and like he's going to take care of me. But then, you know, you're in that that spiritual high and then all of a sudden you kind of come down a little bit because of the way that the world is and you see things in your present reality that's right in front of you and you start to kind of forget the miracle that that happened. Um, and, you know, one thing that it says in Deuteronomy, which is uh, which is awesome, is that, you know, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. And this is, um, you know, Moses talking to the, the new generation of Israelites who uh, need to acknowledge of like where they've come from, where they where they have graduated from. Um, and I think that's something that we need to do as well. And essentially, like. What it is, is that we have a sense of pride thinking that we are the ones who can figure something out when in reality, it's actually God who is the one who we need to submit it to. And I think the best way I can think about it is that pride is taking and claiming something under your own self, taking it on as your own burden and submission and surrender is knowing that it was never yours and giving it over to the father and asking for his will to be done. And essentially, that's what Paul and Silas were doing there in the prison. They were beaten. They were stripped. They were thrown in jail. They have nothing left. They're probably hungry. They're starving. They don't know what's coming next. They know that death is in front of their door, is knocking at their door. And yet they celebrate God because of who he is. They know because he is good and that he's come through before. They, their reflection goes back to all the things that they've already seen him do. Paul wasn't Paul was around when Jesus was alive, but he didn't see him directly. He had an encounter with him which changed his entire life and led him to be um, the incredible uh, disciple that he was. You know And one thing that I think that we forget, I think especially when we are in the midst of some, going through something is that we feel abandoned, we feel alone, we feel lost. Like God isn't there anymore, but that's just not re- that's not true. Again, if you go farther out in Deuteronomy, it says, "Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you." God only wants good for us. He wants to push us into our best day. He's there with us through the battle, fighting for us constantly. And we have to be the ones to remember to look back and know and trust that He has a good will and purpose for our life, yet we live in a sin-stricken world that is filled with doubt, it's filled with worry, it's filled with anxiousness, it's filled um, with sorrow. But being able to look back and see what God has done and brought us out of is how we can constantly reflect who He is in the image He has made us in. And that leads me to my second point, which is that a reflex of praise makes you a reflection of God. Now, if we were to look in Acts 16, 26, so it's a little farther down in the story. uh, In verse 26, it says, Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open, and he assumed that the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop, don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How interesting is that, that the Roman soldier runs after Paul and Silas after this crazy earthquake and is asking, how do I be saved? When in fact, Paul and Silas are the ones who are literally in a place where they need to be rescued and saved. That's so interesting to me. And actually, if you look at the Greek word for saved, it's sozo. And it means to save a suffering one from perishing. Who are the ones that are actually waiting for death? Paul and Silas. And then another definition is to preserve one who is in danger of destruction or to rescue. And I find it so ironic that the Roman soldier was doing the exact same, was doing what Paul and Silas actually needed, 
where in fact he knew that he needed something deeper, that there was something eternal, that there was a reason of why they were praising and worshiping in the midst of their hardship. There's a reason why even though it was dark in that prison that there was a light shining off of them. It's because God was being reflected in the people that he chose to outwork his will. By them singing and praising in the midst of their hardship, they were able to be an example of what it means to be made in the image of God. The reason the Roman soldier went to them was because he knew that there was something deeper that he needed. This was something that he didn't understand. This Roman soldier probably had been in there multiple times, had seen multiple prisoners come through, had seen them beheaded, hanged, crucified, everything. And all of them probably did the same thing. They wallowed in sorrow. They just tried to take their last few moments of, or few hours to just try and fill whatever it is that they needed. But then he saw this and it was just such a miraculous turn of events that he just could not contemplate and couldn't understand. And when he saw the power of God outworked, he knew it was something he needed. He said, our spiritual reflex has a power to influence others to a breakthrough moment and to where they are able to see what the true image of God looks like. And essentially, even the chains that were broken off of Paul and Silas weren't the only chains that were broken off that night. There were scales lifted off of this Roman soldier's eyes, just like there was with Paul. There was things in walls that were brought down of this Roman soldier and his ideology of what he believed in before he saw an image of the true living God in his children. Incredible. And just think that like God has actually like made us that way. He made us in his image to be a reflection of him. And you know, if we go back down into Acts and they say, they replied in verse uh, 31, uh, it's going to be believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. Even at the hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, washed their wounds. And then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. This brings me to point number three. A reflex of praise has a generational impact. The Roman soldier, his chains broke down that night, just like I said. And because of that, he was able to bring what he saw, the miracle that he witnessed, to the people that mattered to him most. And that it went into his family. And not only is it going to be in this immediate, his immediate children or wife or whoever was there in that household, but now it's a ripple effect. It's going down all through the generations of each one of those people, each one of his sons, that the Holy Spirit has now come in and replaced everything that was in there before and made it new. The thing is, is that we never know when God is willing to, when God is going to be ready to use us. But we have to be ready. We have to have that, that initial instinct and that reflex to be able to praise him, to be able to worship him in the midst of everything that's going on. You know, it can be hard to acknowledge that you're not in control. It's in our DNA as human beings. We're sinful creatures. We want to do things our way. We want to do things the way we want them to get a, a certain result. But the fact is, is that we need to acknowledge that this is not our world that it is not our will that needs to be done, that it is the Father's. And we simply can't. It simply just can't be ours because we're flawed and sinful creatures and God knows what we need, when we need it, and why we need it. And sometimes that's a process. And sometimes that takes going through hardship. That means going through those moments where my mom had cancer and, and having to be like, okay, God, I don't know how we're gonna get through this. I don't know how to even trust you right now. But I, God, I know that you're good. And I know that you'll never leave me or abandon me. I know that you're a healer. I know that you're a provider for when the funds aren't in the account. I know that you're gonna be there to help pick me up and to get me to my best day, regardless of anything that's happening. 
God is the foundation that cannot be shaken. He is that peace during the trial. He is hope in hopelessness. He is that light when we feel like we're in a room of darkness. And it's through him that we can that we can find this peace, that we can find our identity and know that he is the one that we need to turn to. In Genesis, it says that we are made in his image, that he has chosen to reflect himself in us. Like what an honor that is that he has chosen us to represent himself and that he wants to use us to outwork his glory and his will. Like that's so crazy. And essentially, as we go through different things in, in this life because things are bound to happen until we return home to heaven. You know, just like there is a good God, that there is an evil enemy who is out here to try and destroy us, to disassociate us from who our Father really is and the and the thing in the hope and the thing that we can put our hope in to make us think that things in the world is what can give us satisfaction. Things in the world is what can make us feel better in the midst of a hardship because he's trying to create divide and distance between the one that we were made in the image of. And so know that when you go through certain things that there is a solution and it is turning to the Father and praising him for all that he's done before you, before knowing that he will get you through your trial your environment your circumstance and on and get you out stronger on the other end making you more like him every step of the way thank you